Goedemorgen. Uh, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to uh, dialogue with you again. I use the word dialogue in a loose way because, yes, as I've had a chance to prepare, present, I've had the opportunity, in fact, the privilege to talk with various, various folk here. Some I met for the first time, some I've met before. In fact, one I went to school with so far back, um, 40 something years ago. And uh, we had a wonderful visit last evening. <coughs> so there is some dialogue. Plus, I have received so many questions. I was up till I think 12.30 last night, half past 12. And then I tried to sleep in till 7. But I woke up at about half past 5. And, uh, and looking at all of, what, all of the material you have sent in, incredible amount of questions. And so I will admit that, well... <coughs> I didn't get very much sleep last night, but I did have an interesting time reading what you have shared in writing. I'm going to get out my clicker here, and then we're going to dig into the Word. And this topic that we were looking at, uh, Pastor Callis actually was correct when he said that I <laughs> have dug into this material. I started studying this topic in 1989, before the feast-keeping issue became to the fore, 1989, believe it or not. And I'll admit, even back then, I was confused about part of it. <laughs> and so it took a lot of work. I, when I, I was writing a paper in class for Dr. Hans LaRondel. Some of you may be aware of him. He's passed away a few years ago. And <coughs> it was a paper, I was in the topic called The Doctrine of the Sabbath. And so when I was in that class, I decided to study, believe it or not, the topic of Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, which is what we're going to look at today in this presentation this morning. Colossians 2, 16. And as I studied the topic, frankly, I will admit, I got confused because others had written about it, and I read what some well-known scholars had written, and... When I wrote the introduction to my paper, I, you know, paper that you have to write for class, I say write, type, obviously. Computers had come along by 1989. I was confused. In my introduction, I said, it doesn't matter what conclusion you come to. <laughs> I was so confused. Whether it's the Seventh-day Sabbath in this text or it's ceremonial Sabbath, it really doesn't matter. I'm sure there are still salv uh, salvific information for us. That's how confused I was. I struggled, I struggled with the text, dug deep personally to, able to be able to understand it. But after about two weeks, I was a doctoral student at Andrews University at that time, after about two weeks, suddenly there was light, and I was, wow, here it began to make sense. The Lord blessed as I uh, worked on that. And then several years later, I'm giving a little background before I get into our topic here. Several years later, I came across uh, a young man, uh, a young lady, by the way, at a, con at a conference. She came to me. She asked me questions. And so today we're going to look at this topic. I'm calling it Setting the Sabbath at Rest. It's a play on words. I know I told you that the word Sabbath itself doesn't mean rest. It means to rest from cessation. But most people think that the word means rest. But I'm putting the t this idea, I'm seeking to put to rest the idea as uh, of the wrong information on Colossians 2.16. And at that time, I began to search and study. I had to spend a lot of time. It was a paper for class. The paper turned out to be studying the Bible. Uh, the paper was 100 pages long. And it was a fun time I had writing the paper. And years later, when a young lady at a conference came to ask me a question on Colossians 2.16, she said, can I get the information? This is about 10, 15, 20 years later. I said, okay, I'll send it to you. I found out later why she was concerned about Colossians 2.16. She was dating, courting a non-Seventh-day Adventist, and he had challenged her on this verse. Okay. So we're going to begin with some uh, reminders here. The Sabbath, the Seventh-day Sabbath itself was made for man, mankind. Mark 2 verse 27. We're thankful that God gave the Sabbath to us. It's a love gift to the entire human race. Just keep that as the foundation of what we're going to do today, this morning. And of course, Ellen White herself reminds us that the Seventh-day Sabbath is going to be key in the time of the final crisis. In the Review and Herald of, Mo of November 19, 1908, Ellen White says, The end of all things is at hand. By the way, this is a hundred and what? Six 
years ago when she said the end of all things is at hand. In the context of the 6,000 years approximately of Earth's history, that is still so. The time of trouble is about to come upon the people of God. Then it is that the decree will go forth, forbidding those who keep the Sabbath of the Lord to buy or sell, and threatening them with punishment and even death if they do not observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath. So keep that in mind in the context as we're looking at Colossians 2.16. Does this text talk about the seventh-day Sabbath or ceremonial Sabbath? And we know, of course, that it's the Apostle Paul that wrote the text. Here it is in, the, uh, in a version that uh, stays quite literally with the text. This is actually the Revised Standard Version. If you look back at the Greek and you look at the English of this, it's about one of the clearest expositions or translations. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Now, incidentally, on that last word, a Sabbath, I'm going to pause right here. I have to tell you a little story. I wrote a, 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 an article on this. Actually, it turned out to be um, somewhere I, I presented this, and um, a friend of mine, uh, if I'm remembering, no, no, it was actually the, the, the study that came out in 2000 and seven or eight. And a friend of mine wrote a critique of my study, personal friend, and he said, Ron Dupre, in public, he wrote this, got published, Ron Dupre is completely wrong that it's a Sabbath. It must be Sabbath plural. And uh, I, before he published it, he call, I called him and we talked a bit, and I said, wait a minute, you say Ron Dupre is wrong. Did you notice that I'm quoting a whole array of scholars? So he changed his critique and before he published it, he said, Ron Dupre and all the scholars are wrong. <laughs> and they published it. But that's okay. But that forced me to go back. And I went back and studied and, and took a lot of time. And I ended up writing 63 pages looking at the history of the interpretation of that word for 2,250 years fascinating study. Going all back to the time of Zephon, there's a papyrus that was discovered 250 years before Christ. And what's interesting, the word sabbata in that text for 2,250 years has always consistently, including in the Septuagint, all the way through, all the way through to now, the word sabbata is not, as my friend claimed, plural. It's actually a, used as a singular, unless you have a numeral next to it. It's like in English. If I say, look at the sheep, and you say, how many? Ha, ah, how many? Sheep, it could be one, correct? It could be a thousand. Isn't that true? Deer, even nowadays they say elephant. It, we used to say elephants, but they dropped the ass off. Fish, we don't know until we have a numeral. And so I did the research, studied deeply, and um, not only he said Ron Dupre and all the scholars are wrong, it turned out that he was wrong <laughs> against the entire way in which the word has used, been used for 2,250 years. The reason I share with this with you is because, you see, there are some debates that are happening between scholars, but we have to do our homework, and so we are clear what the text actually says. And right now, as some of you know, I'm studying at the University of the Western Cape. I've put the study on hold because my wife came down with cancer. Uh, about five or six years ago, and uh, firstly is my relationship with God, secondly is my family. So I stopped my studies, did virtually nothing for about five years or so, and I'm now on Sabbath. Just before I left the United States, we got a clean bill of health. And just praising the Lord, it's the last report my wife has had, and for the last five years since she had treatment and uh, everything, including an operation, uh, every report has come through saying she is clear of cancer. So we're praising the Lord for that. But in the meantime, my study of Colossians 2 at the University of w the Western Cape, a doctoral degree there, a New Testament study has been put on hold, and now I'm picking that up again. <laughs> in fact, I'm heading down there in a couple of weeks' time, and I'm hoping to see my professor to see if I can pick it up and continue with this very text I'm sharing with, with you today. Prover providentially been able to study it for many, many years. So now I'm taking you back to, my, to the screen. This text has had an, a challenge going back to the time of Irenaeus around A.D. 200, but between 130 and 200, that's when Irenaeus lived approximately, he said, it is displeasing to the Lord for Christians to keep feast day or new moons or the Sabbaths, according to Colossians 2.16. Hence, 
we are not to observe the seventh day Sabbath any longer. You follow the logic? Because they believed way back then, shortly after John, it, the revelator had died, Irenaeus came along and it was used back then to, to give up the seventh day Sabbath. Of course, there are modern challenges that have come along as well. For example, by here are the names of three men who have said this passage, Colossians 2.16, is the death blow to all sects which observe the seventh-day Sabbath. And of course, who's he talking about? Including us, you see that? That's B.H. Carroll. Then somebody else, H.M. Riggle, says, Paul refutes all the theories of Sabbatarians, talking about this text. Or as L. Halfley has put it, Colossians 2.16 says the Sabbath is not binding. Now, there are many statements by people who have used Colossians 2.16 to discard or to discontinue or to throw out the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, what's interesting, when I first uh, began to uh, share on the matter of Colossians 2.16, my, my focus was the question whether or not this text has the seventh-day Sabbath in it or ceremonial Sabbath. And because of the study I had done, one of the three ABN people by the name of Shelley Quinn. Are you aware of Shelley Quinn? Shelley Quinn contacted me and she said, she said, Ron, I understand you've done some study on Colossians 2.16. She said, I myself with Danny Shelton, we've written a book, uh, Ten Commandments Twice Removed. And, and in that we say Colossians 2.16 is ceremonial Sabbaths. Many people are challenging us. Can, you've done lots of research on it. And of course, I had already written that 100-page paper for Dr. Laurendel's class. I had now had a chance to dig deeper. I was already registered at the University of the Western Cape. And I was studying it. And I, she said, would you come to 3ABN and make a presentation? Which I did. So I went there for a Thursday live about uh, seven years ago or so. And when I was done with my presentation, six or seven years ago, 2007 or 2008, I was amazed because I got, a, a literally, I'm not exaggerating, I got a pile of papers. People sent me reams and reams of papers. And I was reading this material and it didn't quite make sense. I'll tell you why it didn't make sense. The purpose of me speaking on 3ABN was to try to reach out to non-Seventh-day Adventists in order to show them from the text, which we will be doing this morning, showing them in the text, linguistically, exegetically, intertextually, contextually, structurally, that this is ceremonial Sabbath in the text. Because many evangelicals, other Christians, use this text and say the Sabbath is not valid. Why this text? Well... You have a lot of texts in the Old Testament saying, keep the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath. But when you get to the New Testament, the only record of Sabbath keeping is the actions of Jesus. There's no direct statement, you must keep the Sabbath. You follow what I'm saying? In the Old Testament, thou shalt keep, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. When you get to the New Testament, it never says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We only have the examples of Jesus and the apostles and other people, Jewish, Christian, uh, Jews who were keeping it. And then when Jesus died and the Christian church started, we find the apostles keeping it. There is no theological statement talking about the Sabbath at all, except they claim Colossians 2.16. That's the only place where the word Sabbath appears and it's in the theology. It's not in the history. You follow the point? It's not in the story, in the book of Acts, or in the Gospels. And so this text becomes a key passage used by many folk who say, wait a minute, we know that Jesus and the apostles did keep it, but when we get into the theology, into the letters, into that which was written to the rest of the churches, we find the word, the word Sabbath in Colossians 2.16. And then they conclude, because the word is there, this must refer to the seventh-day Sabbath. The reason I went to speak on 3ABN was in order to share with people the internal evidence that's overwhelmingly clear, which we'll be showing you today, that this is ceremonial Sabbath, not seventh day. But when the presentation was over, the questions that came in online, they sent people, sent questions, and then people emailed me. I often do this. I'm not sure how wise it is, but on television, I'll put my email up and my phone. <laughs> and it's amazing. People call. I've gotten calls from different places outside of the United States as well. Somebody calls from Jamaica. Somebody writes to me from Australia. And it's just amazing. The problem is I shouldn't do it because then I feel responsible to respond. And it takes a lot of time, but these are inquiring people. Our goal was to reach out to non-Adventists, but guess who wrote back to me? Adventists. Virtually all were Adventists. <laughs> and not only were they Adventists, I don't remember one non-Adventist writing to me. They were Adventists 
at least they said they were, but these were Adventist feast keepers. And of course, I'm, I'm being honest, I didn't understand why they were writing to me. Because I was trying to speak to non-Adventists, showing that Colossians 2 is, this, is ceremonial Sabbath. They wrote to me and they said, no, you are wrong. It's not ceremonial Sabbath, it's the Seventh-day Sabbath. And that to me is amazing, because 18 years before I had done this research in my class with Dr. Lauren Dell, a doctoral class, and I had even made presentations on the topic. I had other committed, conservative, Bible-believing, spirit of prophecy-supporting, evidence scholars who supported me, people like Dr. Mervyn Maxwell, said, Ron, this is a good study. You need to share this. Dr. Richard Davidson, still at the seminary, this is important. You've got to get this material out. And for about 18 years, I hadn't done anything about it. I had other things that took time, and I was busy uh, finishing my studies and, and working. And now I'm on 3ABN sharing this pretty much for the first time in that public venue, and instead I get Adventists responding, saying, it's not ceremonial. It's the seventh day. Well, it took me a, a while to now go back and understand why my feast, uh, these feast keepers were responding. And so notice one of the people who wrote to me, his name was Eisendrath, T. Eisendrath said, Colossians 2, 16 and 17 is the strongest argument in all the scriptures for the continuation of the feast days. And I, I, I'll be honest, I was like, what do you mean? Why? And eventually I began to understand. Let me summarize it this way. Okay? Watch the logic. If Colossians 2, 16 is the seventh day Sabbath, let's assume that for a moment. Are you with me? We keep the Sabbath, don't we? Okay, Be if we keep the Sabbath, the three terms go together, feast, new moon, and Sabbath. The three are there. They're interlinked. You cannot separate the one from the other. And so if you keep the Sabbath and the three terms go together, therefore we should keep the feasts and the new moons. You follow? And then I began to understand. It, uh, uh, and once I began to understand, it was about two or three years later when 3ABN asked me to come back and make another presentation, this time not on the last word, Sabbath, in the text, but this time on the first one, feasts of the three. <laughs> and then a year later, they asked me to come back and then talk about new moons. <laughs> so I happened to be on three events three times, talking about three words in one text. <laughs> it was an interesting uh, opportunity. And, and as I tell you these stories, uh, it was not just an interesting opportunity, it took a lot of work. And, and of course, fortunately, the Lord provided, the Lord had me in the right job at the right time so that I could have free time <laughs> to research and to go there to present. And so, you know, God opens the doors. Are you with me? I'm not for a moment taking credit. I was just fortunate, blessed by God to be in the right place at the right time and given opportunity to go to the foremost theological library in the Adventist Church, and that is at Andrews University. Lots of resources and correct tools, correct techniques, and so now we will go into this topic further. But this is the way the logic is. In other words, in a nutshell, our feast keepers on Colossians 2.16 are in full agreement with non-Seventh-day Adventists as to what the text means. And the feast keepers are fully against the Seventh-day Adventist church's understanding of this from way back in the 19th century. So that's another thing that needs to be kept in mind. By the way, I was not even aware myself of all of this. I began to study the text before I even found out and, and realized what we officially understood and why. I had an idea, but as I wrote my paper the first time in 1989, as I said to you, I was so confused, I was actually giving up the standard Adventist view. I really did. I pushed aside the standard Adventist view. What is the standard Adventist view on Colossians 2.16? It's ceremonial Sabbaths. But I was so confused, I put it on the shelf. And I said, I don't know. Is it Seventh-day Sabbath or is it ceremonial? I said, hmm, I can still find something good, some lesson. In other words, it's a difficult topic. I want to make you aware of that. So now with that in mind, I hope you have a pen and paper because here is an example of the confusion that has been caused. When they look at 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 3, for example, they notice the terms that are similar. When they take, notice the dot, 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 part of the verse is taken out. And they see the word Sabbath, they see the word new moons, they see the word set feasts. And uh, I agree because the word the is there. 
the identifies Seventh-day Sabbath consistently in the Old and New Testament. Whenever you have the article, the, in a good literal English translation, and in, uh, such as the New King James Version, it's accurate. When you have the there, it's Seventh-day Sabbath. Okay, it's pretty accurate. Now, you have to go back to the original Hebrew and Greek. And by the way, even if you don't know Hebrew and Greek, you can get an interlinear Bible. They will show you whether the word is actually there. Even if you don't know the Hebrew and Greek, you just read the English. So, sure enough, correct, the word the is in this text. It is the seven-day Sabbath in Chronicles, please note. Now, people go to Colossians 2.16 and they say, look, it looks like we have, uh, uh, don't we have the same terms there? We have feast, new moon, and Sabbath. And then we have Sabbaths, new moons, feasts. Now, now notice the difference. Uh, notice the two green lines. The first green line, Sabbaths, new moons, feast. That comes from Second Chronicles 31 as they've excerpted it. And then they compare that with the second green line there, feast, new moon, Sabbath. And if you look at it on the surface, does it look the same? Almost, right? What's the difference? It's turned around, correct? What else? One has plural, one has singular. Did you notice that? Okay. Okay. Uh, that's, that's the second thing. But the third thing is they've only taken out part of Second Chronicles. They didn't tell you the rest. The conclusion from many people is that is, this is an Old Testament triad, they call it. So they, uh, Colossians 2 deals with the Seventh-day Sabbath is their conclusion. Because they've taken part of Second Chronicles out, out of context. They've taken a part out. That's one of the things I want to urge you to do. Be very careful. People have taken things out of context. That's why you have the dot, dot, dot. You follow that? They've taken out part of it, and it's inverted, and it's a plural, and they say it's the same. Well, is it so? I'm going to try to move rapidly, but I need you to understand why it's a problem. For the Apostle Paul, when we go to Paul's studies, it's very interesting that for Paul, when he writes in the Bible, the uh, number, whether it's singular or plural, is very important. Now, some have claimed that Colossians 2 has a triad as in some Old Testament texts. I gave you one example. But these are all, all superficial similarities. Paul was a very careful student of the Old Testament, even taking into account the singular and the plural when he was quoting in order to clearly communicate precisely the truth that the Holy Spirit desired him to make. Let me illustrate that to you right now. Okay? Look at, for example, in your Bibles, you'll see here where Paul is actually quoting from Galatians 3.16. I'm using the NIV. You can look at any Bible. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, Paul is saying. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, Paul says. Wait a minute, Paul's making an important point. It's not plural, Paul says, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Now, interesting, Paul is quoting from Genesis, and he's making a specific point telling you that number is important. Is it singular or is it plural? And by the way, when you go to the Old Testament, guess what? It is singular. Even though there's one place where the King James, the New King James Version says, and to his descendants, then it has a little footnote that says, literally, his seed. So the translator actually mistranslates it, calls it descendants, but then in the, in the margin says, by the way, it actually does say singular seed. <laughs> so at least the, the translator who was wrong tells you they, they did it wrongly <laughs> and tells you what the right way is, showing that Paul is right. Paul is very precise, very careful. And so I am suggesting the only Old Testament passage that uses the same terms in the same sequence, in the same number, singular, is Hosea 2 verse 11. And that's the only place, and we'll unpack that later on, where you have the three terms, feast, new moon, Sabbath. And there we will see what kind of Sabbath it is talking about. There's only one place, and not, I'm not the only one. There's, an, there's another non seventh Avenue scholar who has clearly articulated it. I believe his last name is Schweitzer. He says Paul's three-part sequence is the same as in Hosea chapter 2, verse 11. Fascinating. So Paul is not quoting these other places that have confused people. It's Hosea chapter 2, verse 11. Now let's go to 2 Chronicles uh, verse, uh, chapter 31, verse 3. Okay, and I've added in the important part they've left out. And that is, for, it talks about for the morning and evening burnt offerings. And the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths and the new moons and the appointed seasons. So there's a four-part sequence. Did you notice that? 
it's burnt offerings for four different things. And you can look at the full text if you want to. It wasn't a three-part. It's a four-part one, and it's in a completely different order, and it's talking about burnt offerings. So this is just an example to you of the fact that sometimes texts have been taken out of context. Here it is. I'm illustrating again. It's for the morning and evening, burnt offerings, and the Sabbath. That text in Chronicles is talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath, yes, and for the new moons and the appointed seasons. So here is a four-part sequence, M slash E, morning and evening, sacrifices, Sabbath with a capital S, plural, e, moon, new moons, plural, and appointed seasons. Now notice, the Jewish Publication Society Bible translates it as appointed seasons, and they are right. The Jews are correct here. It's a careful translation. The word is not feasts <laughs> in Second Chronicles. Notice that. That's what has confused the feast keepers. They look at Second Chronicles and they didn't realize and they say, hey, it's the word feast. It's not the word feast. The Jewish Publication Society Bible has correctly pointed out it's appointed seasons, which is not the same as feasts, actually. It's a different word and it's a broader concept. So you will, when you look at it and you look at it carefully, you'll find that the, the differences are m greater when you have that. And here is the comparison. Chronicle, uh, Second Colossians, uh, sorry, Colossians 2 Verse 16 has feast, singular, new moon, singular, and Sabbath, singular. Compared with above, the burnt offerings are on the morning and evening, on the seventh day Sabbaths, on the new moons, on the appointed seasons. Very interesting. By the way, as you study the Bible throughout Scripture, you will find that the plural Sabbaths is used because it's a regular weekly occurrence. We'll provide evidence in our next session when I attempt to respond and answer and provide uh, direction for the multiple questions that you handed in uh, over the last few days. Since Friday, questions have been coming in, comments, which I appreciate. So we'll look at that further. And also the focus in Second Chronicles chapter 31, verse 3, is the burnt offerings. Specifically, that's the focus. The burnt offerings, morning and evening, and on the seventh day Sabbath, on the new moons and the appointed seasons. What's interesting, Colossians has a different phrase coming from a different place, which we will examine later on. So, conclusion from meticulous Bible study. There is, this is a quadrad, and it has no connection with Colossians 2.16. It's quite different, especially since Paul is such a careful student of scripture. When he selects, he's careful about singulars and plurals, as we saw in the book of Galatians. And now he's in the little book of Colossians. We don't think he's going to suddenly take a four-part sequence, turn it around, cut off the plural, and cut off one part, and then say it's the same thing. You follow? <laughs> it's, it, Paul is not that poor a student. He was one of the greatest. In fact, he was the theologian, so to speak, of the New Testament, trained by Gamaliel, a brilliant, careful student of scripture. What I'm urging you to do, be careful, be a thorough student. And again, I'll admit, when I studied the test first, I was a doctoral student, and I wrestled, and I was confused. <laughs> so if you ever think, oh, I'm confused, don't feel bad, <laughs> okay? It's difficult, because sometimes on the surface, things look a certain way, but that's not the way they are when you go real deep down to rock bottom, as they say. We have to dig as for hidden treasure. Now, I don't want to discourage you because Ellen White makes a beautiful statement in Steps to Christ. I believe it's around page 89 where she says this. The great truths of the scripture are too plain to be misunderstood. The great truths of salvation to be saved. You don't have to worry. See, the great truths of salvation from the Bible are too plain to be misunderstood. And none need err. Nobody needs to go astray. Then she does say, however, however, this is page 90, 91, 92, there are some things that only by deep digging do we find the answers. So don't say, oh, this is so difficult. People will never find salvation. No, the great truths of salvation are too plain to be misunderstood. Take courage. This is, these are additional th questions that have been raised over time. So we'll dig deeper into the Bible. And yes, I admit, sometimes it's like that Rosetta Stone that Champollion took 22 years to decipher hieroglyphics. But Ellen White does say such study will be richly repaid. So we'll get back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. And now I'm going to remind you of the historic Adventist view versus the majority view. We as Adventists have historically said that when we go to the context, we look at it from that perspective. Adventists generally, as a people, have not, under, or have not mined deeply to study the text. But correctly, we have said the context is what we've looked at. 
When we get to the question, what is the handwriting of ordinances in verse 14? We as Adventists have said it's the ceremonial law from the context. And by the way, we have some non-Seventh Adventist scholars up to last year. I just got a book in November that was published, I believe, 2012 or 13. And there's a non-Adventist scholar who I've just added into my new edition of this uh, feast keeping who, who says the, uh, these are ceremonial Sabbaths. He's not an Adventist, and yet he says... Colossians 2, 14 to 16, 17 is ceremonial Sabbath. So there are non adventist scholars to this day who are interpreting the text the way we do. You follow what I'm saying? We are not unique. We are not alone. When the question comes to what is feast, Newman, and Sabbath, Adventists have said these are Israel's sacred times. That's our standard historic view. What is the shadow of things to come? Verse 17, these are the types that point to Christ. That's what we have said for 120, 130, however many years we've been on, uh, we've been going way back from we, when we became a church. Some of the time that the Adventists were looking at this text. So in other words, verse 16 are the ritual Sabbaths or the ceremonial Sabbaths, and, but we keep the weekly Sabbath. The majority, however, including my feast-keeping friends say, no, 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 there's a triad in this text. And so they will ask you this question. The festivals happen how often? And your immediate response will be what? How often? Yearly. Correct. But once you've given that answer, you may be in a trap because it's not exactly correct. The festivals are only part of them. It's, it's what they call the pilgrim festivals, but, but they assume it's all the festivals. But Anyway, that's their, this is their approach. The majority say festivals, how often? Annually. Next question, new moon, how often? Monthly, correct. Now, therefore, you've gotten annual, monthly, logically. Sabbath, how often will they ask you? What's the, what's the logic? Weekly. You follow that? You've got annual, monthly, weekly. That's the logic. But my question to you is today, this is logical, a logical view. But is this logical view theological? truth? That's the question. We human beings approach the text too many times logically. We have to approach it theologically. Now, I, I need to sound a little caution here about Bible commentaries. A commentary simply makes comments on the text. I had the opportunity in, in to look for uh, and different commentaries in London at the uh, British Library, at the Library of Congress, at Andrews University, looking to find commentary sets. I've had a chance to find about 100 Bible commentaries. And in these about 100 Bible commentaries, 91 of them claim that Colossians 2.16 refers to the Seventh-day Sabbath. Only four commentaries, including the Adventist commentary, right, state that this is ceremonial Sabbaths. Now, if we're going to go with a majority, we're going to believe it's the seventh day. Are you with me? But if we stay with the majority, we would not be in the ark at the time of Noah. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Majority is, can be a very dangerous place to go. We have to go back and ask, is it in the text? And I, I, I've, I've found this fascinating. And I photocopied the material. None of the 91 commentaries dig into the text to find the meaning of the terms feast, doom, and Sabbath. None. Categorically, I can say none. In fact, people said, you are arrogant to say that. I said, I've got the material. I've got, you can come here. You can check it out yourself. Not one has done any interpretation. They simply assume it. It's scary. How, how is that possible? But guess what? Even the four, the four including Adventists who say it is ceremonial, have also not dug into the text. <laughs> so both sides are making what we call assumptions. The Adventist view is made on the assumption that it's the context which I think is a valid assumption, yes, but they still haven't done, dug deep into the text. And so this is why it caught my attention, and I was encouraged by people, and eventually I decided I will go and study, which is why I'm now at the University of the Western Cape, and I'm going to try to get that study going again. These 91 assume or claim it refers to the Seventh-day Sabbath. The other four assume and claim it is not. <laughs> By the way, that's one way to find a good topic if you want to do your doctorate. <laughs> I know some may be interested in going further study. That's the way to get it. So this is what we must do. We must get back to the Word. Ellen White puts it this way. I mentioned it before. I'm repeating it here. Scripture must be compared with Scripture. There must be what? Careful research. And what? Prayerful reflection. And such study will be richly repaid. Steps of Christ, page 91 through 92. And this is what I have attempted to do in, in the process and finding out information. Now, I'm going to ask you a quick question. What does the following sentence mean? 
The last, uh, sorry, last year I went to London and, what am I talking about when I say last year? Two, yes, but what, if I say last year, when was last year? 2013, yes. 2013 in the year, same idea, in the year, more clear, in the year 2013, I went to London and, okay? Now, I'm going to add one word in front of that sentence. The last year I went to London and, which specific year am I talking about? Which one? You don't know, correct? Anyone. <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? I find English very curious and some people very difficult. Just adding a definite article, the, now makes the entire sentence indefinite. Isn't that curious? But you see, we understand the language, right? Because we understand the language, we know the answer comes from what we call linguistic links. Now, when we go to the Bible, we're going to illustrate that on the matter of Colossians 2.16. So we want to go back to the Old Testament. And we're going to look at Exodus 31, verses 13 through 15. Write these references down and make a note of them because I want you to go back and check it out for yourself. And this is not unique to me. Later on, after I had done my study, dug deeply, Towards the end, I, this is while I was at Andrews studying under Dr. La Rondell, I found out that John Andrews, one of our early Adventist pioneers who was a brilliant scholar, no, I didn't say perfect, none of us is perfect, okay, we're not inspired, <laughs> only Ellen White and the prophets are inspired, so, but I'm glad that he saw something similar, okay? So we have some others who went before us, we build on their shoulders if we are aware of it. If not, we, can, we might find it on later on. And here's the interesting thing. Whenever the Seventh-day Sabbath is talked about, there are clear, significant linguistic links. One, two, three, four, just on the Sabbath. And here are examples of it. In Exodus 31, verses 13 through 15, my Sabbaths you shall keep. When you see the word my, when you see the word keep, con directly connected with the word Shabbat, or the word the, or the word holy, or the word days, okay, or day, directly connected with it, it or the word sev seventh, and the, of course, obviously, you know it's the seventh-day Sabbath. These are examples of it. Now, I want to contrast these examples of linguistic links to clearly identify. Yes, when God inspired the prophet to write, the, he didn't inspire them word for word. We know that. But obviously, as the Holy Spirit worked through the prophet naturally, the Holy Spirit made sure that the prophet would record these things with critical clarity of communication. So that when we get it later on, we knew what he was talking about, right? It's obvious. It has to be. Otherwise, why would God want to send a love letter that makes no sense? Leviticus 23 verse 32 has, is a contrast. When we look at Leviticus 23 verse 32, it says, and the same word Shabbat appears. That's the identical Hebrew word. And as I mentioned yesterday, unfortunately, Strong's Concordance, the dictionary section, does not tell you that the word Shabbat means ceremonial Sabbath. They claim it's seventh-day Sabbath. That's why I urge you to get a better um, resource. But according to the Hebrew, according to the best dictionaries, the word Shabbat is used here. It's ceremonial. It shall be to you a Sabbath. Notice the word the is not there. That's the first clue that wakes you up. A Sabbath, not the Sabbath. Well, if the word was the, if it was a definite article, it would be seventh-day. But the word the is not there. Without the word the there, you have to ask. Sometimes, by the way, you find the word uh, Sabbath. It could be seventh day, Sabbath, but there will be other links that help you to recognize it. However, whenever the word the is there in the Hebrew or in the Greek, it is always seventh day Sabbath. The definite article identifies it. But it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls. Now, what's interesting, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13 says, Call the Sabbath delight. Now, obviously, there's a, there's, a, there's a contrast here. Why must you afflict your souls on Sabbath? Because it's the Day of Atonement. More evidence, on the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Contrasted with my Sabbath. Very interesting. And as I began to dig into the scriptures from Genesis all the way through Revelation, a consistent pattern began to emerge. Firstly, in the Old Testament. I discovered that there were many Old Testament links for the seventh day, you must keep it. It was identified by the word the. This, it was the seventh day, day of the week. The word yom is used there. With God, it is called holy, directly connected. God says it's my Sabbath. And sometimes it's on a cycle from Sabbath to Sabbath on a weekly cycle. These were six clear 
links, by the way, the context even made it clearer as well. Okay, and you can see that. But just the wording alone, context made it more uh, lucid. Now, what about the others? What about the feast Sabbaths? With a small s notice, I put that myself. Now, translations don't often differentiate. Uh, I think it's the King James Version and some others, it revised standard version. They have a small s pretty much throughout. So some translators just keep it as a small s. But I put it myself to differentiate. I've added a capital S. Personally, I put that for the seventh day. And for the feast Sabbath, I've had a small s, lowercase as they call it. Number one, you must afflict your soul. You don't do that for the seventh day Sabbath. Number two, there is no definite article. In front of the feast Sabbath, including the seventh year, the, what they call the sabbatical year, every seventh year, the land must lay fallow. The word Shabbat is used for it, but no definite article in the Hebrew ever. Interesting. Okay. Also, it can be your seventh year, as I pointed out, con contrasted with the seventh day. Then, of course, it's her Sabbath, not my Sabbath. Her, meaning Israel's Sabbath, the nation. Also, God says it's your Sabbath when he talks to them directly. And, of course, it can be annual, not just a weekly annual as in the day, as in the uh, day of atonement. Very interesting. So there are enough contrasts here that help us. Words, ideas, these are the links that tie in to clearly contrast between seventh day Sabbath and, of course, the ceremonial Sabbaths and feasts. Very interesting. As I dug further, go back to Colossians 2.16, and I ask myself, in the, in the New Testament text, are there any of the links for the seventh day Sabbath? And the answer is, no, they're not there. No, they're not there at all. Now, by the way, I already cautioned you in the King James Version. I mentioned yesterday, unfortunately, the translators added themselves. They put in the word the, and they put the word day in. They added it in, unfortunately. And so if you read it in English, in fact, I know that because once I made a presentation, somebody came to me right away and said, no, 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 pastor, you're wrong. My Bible says the Sabbath days. It's there, but it's not in the original and you can check it in, a, in an interlinear Bible. And I mentioned that briefly uh, yesterday already. Now we go to the New Testament. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, talking about Jesus, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue. I've underlined and made it in bold because that's a key word on the Sabbath. The Greek there is sabbata, day. And stood up to read. Here are three uh, things that are, uh, uh, the, the word the is there, the word day is there, and the word synagogue. And when you get to the New Testament, those are three terms that help us to know what kind of Sabbath it's talking about. Seventh-day Sabbath. Very interesting. Now, also in the Greek, as I already pointed out to you, Strong's Concordance indicates that there are two uses of the word, but actually there are four. Strong's is unfortunately not adequate enough. But uh, it, it does help us a little bit, only 50% of the time for the New Testament. Strong's helps us only 25% of time for the Old Testament. Now, here is the text in Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath. Okay, what Sabbath are we talking about? Ceremonial or seventh day? Seventh day, correct. And the Greek word is sabbata, right there. But notice, the verse continues. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week. Hmm, interesting. Now, by the way, the words in brackets are added in by the translators because in Greek they simply say, now after the Sabbath as first of week. Now you know what first of week is. In English we add the word first as the first day of the week because that's the way we speak. So those words have been added in by the translator. And by the way, the word week, do you know what the word week is in Greek? Sabata, same word. The, the word sabata is used not just of the seventh day, but it's also used of the seven days itself. Okay, and, and uh, so that's what it, in fact, that's where, this is the place where Strong's does tell you it. It says it's a sand night, seven, uh, so they do identify this one. They've left out the fact, Strong's has left out the fact that the word sabbata also refers to the Day of Atonement, for example, ceremonial Sabbath, as well as the sabbatical years. So that's why I was cautioning you. If you read the Strong's Concordance, it's inadequate to give you the full picture. We want the full picture so we can understand the Bible appropriately. As the Sabbata, the, the, okay, this is the began to dawn, the first day of Sabbata, the first day of the week began to dawn. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Okay, so that's where we see. So there are two uh, things that come out in that text. There's the word first there, when it is linked, the, when the numeral is linked to the word Sabbata. There's more evidence, but I want to uh, just uh, summarize it here. When you get to the New Testament, the, the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, you must keep it 
The word keep is like in the Old Testament connected. The word the, similar to the Old Testament, it's a definite article. The is also there. Whenever you find the word the directly related to sabbata or sabbaton, it's seventh day. The word day is also connected. Very similar to the Old Testament. Have you noticed that? Okay. Very similar. Number four, connected with issues of lawful. Is it lawful to do such and such? Is it lawful directly connected with seventh-day Sabbath? That was a big question that was raised frequently by the Jews. Then the word synagogue. Whenever the word synagogue is connected with sabbata or sabbaton, it's seventh day. This is consistent in the New Testament. And finally, it also talks about every Sabbath. Do this. From Sabbath to Sabbath in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it says kata sabbata. Every Sabbath. Weekly cycle. These are the links that became clear. Now again, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, it took a lot of time to dig into this and find it. And I thought to myself, I, I, be, I, I share with you, and, and, and please, pull your feet in. I may step on a toe or two right now. You know why? Because I realized we as busy human beings, myself included, in fact, a little confession. In January, I shut down my Facebook account. Guess why? I was having too much fun. Finding, connecting, talking, or con uh, uh, communicating with people all over. You know that, you, you, you do know that. Many South Africans, they live in Australia, they live in New Zealand, they live in the United States, they, they're all over, all right? And these are friends that I went to school with. And because I'm now in my 60s, my friends are married and have children. And I post something on Facebook and they write from all over. Hey! And they call me by my nickname, I won't tell you. And they call me and they say, how are you? And what's happening? And so, you know, you don't want to ignore your friends. <laughs> and I found out that I was spending a lot of time on Facebook. And I, I just said, I can't keep up doing this. Now, I did try to post things that would encourage people and, and challenge them. I put health material there, sometimes a bit of humor, uh, you know, uh, like, like the, the, in China, you've probably seen this one where this woman, the Chinese uh, guy came along with his uh, tow truck and put the, tow, the car on the tow truck, the back wheels were still on the ground, and, 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 and then he went to his to get in the truck to pull it away. But the woman came just before he pulled away. She jumped in her car, put it in reverse, and she pulled the tow truck in the opposite direction. And the man started running after the, his truck going away from him. And, uh, you know, funny things like that that I put up. And I was enjoying myself. And then I realized, I'm wasting my time. Yeah, there's nothing wrong in having fun. <laughs> but I realized, so I shut down my Facebook. And the reason I tell you that story, because I know maybe in your life, there's something else that you need to shut down so that you can spend more time with the Word of God. So, so I'm not on there. I quit it in January. I can't afford the time. And the reason I tell you that is I realized as I was studying Colossians 2.16 and these matters, I came to the astounding conclusion that if we, you and I, would spend enough time in the Word of God, these linguistic links would be obvious to us. We would see them so often, we would say, we wouldn't even think about it. They would just jump out at us because we are so fluent, so aware. And I believe, I have concluded that we don't spend enough time in the text. And because we are not familiar enough, we get misled. That's my conclusion. So don't think, oh, this is a lot of study. I think it's we become too distracted by many of the fun things, many of the wonderful things we've been blessed with. That's my conclusion. You think about your own life. I'm just sharing what I realized. So let's go to the Greek word sabbata or sabbaton. And you asked, which is, which is translated as either ceremonial Sabbath or for the word week. Now in the New Testament, we're going to look at the ones. It's connected to the word one. If it says mia ton sabbaton, it's the first day of the week. Understood. Okay. Sometimes it, that's one. Sorry, one. Sometimes it's also first. Yeah, that's right. So it's either the ordinal or the cardinal. First or one. Sometimes it's connected to twice. As in the, in the book of Luke, the Pharisees say to Jesus, we fast dia tu sabatu. Dia, twice in the week, not twice on the Sabbath. So the Greek uh, translators have correctly captured that, and history confirms this. Now, of course, it's also confirmed by the context that the word sabbata or sabbaton is sometimes used for the word week in the New Testament. Okay? We haven't yet gotten to Colossians 2.16. The, the Septuagint translation, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible confirms that. So the question is, what about Colossians 2 verse 16? That's the question we are looking at. Now, just for those who are curious, I put the Greek up there so you can see. And you're saying, well, it's all Greek to me, right? 
but, but not, not totally. I want you to look at that word there. Can you read that word? What is it? Tess, you're right. You see, some of the Greek letters are just like our English ones, okay? But some of them are not. That second word is not ouv. That's, an, that's a Greek noon. That's oun. So some of the letters confuse us because they look the same, but they're, they're actually another letter. So don't try to read that. But just for those who are curious, this is the transliteration. Mei un tis humas krineto. En prose, e en pose, e en mere. Heortes e numenias e sabaton. Okay, so that's the Greek for those who want to know what does it look like, what does it sound like. And the last word there is sabaton. That's a long O when there's a line above it or a long E when there's a line above it. So the question we have to ask ourselves, are there any linguistic links in Colossians 2 verse 16? That the, the verse says with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. The Greek being sabata. Is the word keep here? What's the answer? The word keep, is it there in that verse? No. Is there the word the there? I'm hoping to get a response. Is the there? Is the word day there? In the text, is the word lawful there? Is the word synagogue there? Is the word weekly, the concept there? No, it's not. So the first thing is by what it isn't there. Wait a minute. None of the normal linguistic links in the New Testament are in this text. So that alerts you. Wait a minute. Isn't that interesting? If the Holy Spirit was inspiring the writer of the Bible to clearly communicate something, why did he not tell the writer or inspire the writer to put those words there to make it clear? None of the important linguistic links are there at all. Just the linguistic link. That's the first thing that, that say, wait a minute, this is interesting. Of course, you have to take into account the context, the structure, but that's the first beginning. Interesting, okay. So we recognize the conclusion from at least what isn't there. It doesn't look like the seven-day Sabbath, okay? Most likely it is not because there's no indication of it at all. Now we're asking, is it perhaps the word sabata referring to the word week? Is there any link to one? No. Any, is it related to the word first? No. Is it connected to the word twice as in the rest of the New Testament? No. The conclusion is most likely this is not the word for week. Hmm, okay. Very likely it's not Sabbath. Very likely it's not week. When we go to the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, very interesting. In the Septuagint, we find the word sabata is used for ceremonial Sabbaths. Hmm. So if in the Greek it's sabbata, it is used, for example, for Day of Atonement, then most likely this is also the Day of Atonement, just looking at the linguistics only. We'll look at other factors as well. Remember I told you, I wrote a 100-page paper. We're summarizing it here for this presentation. I ended up, uh, Andrews University asked me, the, the press, so we have a 200-something page book from, on this one verse. So it's gotten larger, and that's what I'm studying at the University of Western Cape, still in the process of digging even deeper on this one text. And there it is again. So we want to look at the English. The New King James Version, the one I have right here with me, says regarding a festival or a new moon or, now they made it a word plural, Sabbath. The Revised Standard Version says, or a Sabbath, and it's, it's a recurring weekly Sabbath or a singular. Now notice, in the New King James Version, none of the seven-day linguistic links are shown there. And the New King James does not even capitalize the word Sabbath. Now, why is that significant? I have to tell you a short story. A personal friend of mine by the name of Justice St. Hilaire, he is the evangelist for the British Columbia Conference. And he was telling me what happened one day. A pastor of, in Canada who, who was talking with, uh, went to, a, went to a, another conference, a Bible conference, at which one of the major translators of this Bible was present, Dr. Farrar. It somehow happened providentially that Dr. Farrar, this translator, one of the translators of the New King James Version, met the Seventh-day Adventist pastor and said to him, you're an Adventist? Yes. He said, you know what? I've got to tell you a story. When we interpreted uh, from the Greek into English the New Testament of this Bible, the entire way through, whenever we saw the word Sabbath, or sabaton, we always made it seventh day Sabbath with a capital S, or if the context required to be the week, obviously they made it week. But when we got to Colossians 2, verse 16, look at your New King James Version. That's the only place where we made it a small s because we knew it was not the seventh day. Wait a minute. If translators of the New King James Version will tell an Adventist pastor that, <laughs> the evidence is mounting, friends. This is not the seven-day Sabbath. And the translator told 
Justice, uh, f my, my friend Justice uh, St. Hilaire told that pastor friend specifically that. And by the way, there are other Bible versions that agree. The Holman Christian Standard Bible does the same thing. Sabbath with a capital S all the way through for the seven-day Sabbath. When it gets to Colossians 2.16, it's a small s. The New English Bible does the same in the New Testament, consistent in the New Testament. Fascinating. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is incredible additional support of evidence that Colossians 2.16 is ceremonial Sabbath, which happens to be the standard historic position of the Seventh Adventist Church. It happens to be the view that Ellen White endorsed. It happens to be, and now it's interesting, there's an overwhelming growing weight of careful biblical scholarship from non-Adventist translators through to even books written, uh, a book on ethics that came out last year. And it's, it's there. And, and then my own personal deep study has brought me to the additional conviction God does not communicate with confusion. He's not a God of confusion. He's a God of order. I mention it again. Remember, I'm not attacking and throwing out the King James Version. I've memorized it myself. That's my, the Bible I got to know as a kid. But on this translation, unfortunately, they have the word the added in by the translators and the word days, and it does confuse people. The word holiday, what does it mean? It's a, it's a, a pilgrim festival. They added the word days, and unfortunately, they forgot to italicize the word the. Now, in the Thomas Newberry edition of the King James Version, they did italicize it. Italics means added in by the translators. You know that. So I'm glad that the Thomas Newberry edition, which came out about a century ago, uh, actually has now corrected that, that uh, somehow it wasn't in the earlier edition. When the, the translator adds it, you know that was not in the original language. So keep that in mind when you get to the King James Version. Don't get confused by that. But I'm thankful that the Thomas Newberry edition has correctly pointed that out. Now, here is the comparison between Hosea chapter 2, I mentioned it earlier, which has the same three terms in the same sequence, all singular, right? With uh, no linguistic links claiming it is a seven-day Sabbath. You'll see that. So here is the three terms. The first word is feast. That's the Hebrew word chag. Okay, and it means pilgrim festivals. I mentioned it before. It's like the Hajj when the uh, Muslims go to Mecca once in their life. H A J J is the Hajj. It's a pilgrimage to Mecca. Arabic, by the way, is close to comes uh, f most likely from Aramaic, and Aramaic is a cousin language to Hebrew. So it's a similar term, a pilgrimage festival. And the pilgrimages were Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. So keep that in mind. That's the first word, and it's limited to that. In scripture. The next word is new moons, Chodesh. And these are the monthly celebrations. But what's interesting, notice A B A. The evidence is mounting now. This is Sabbath, which is Shabbat, okay, or Shabbaton. The evidence is it's trumpets, day of trumpets, day of atonement, and by extension, the sabbatical years. And we call that an A B A pattern, chiastic structure, A B A. I shared it, I think, with you already, the way Ellen White did that also. Remember those pictures, her beautiful poetry, A, B, C, D, C, B, A, and here is an A, B, A pattern structurally. So we have the pilgrim festivals, which are annual, then we have the new moons, which are monthly, and then we have the sabbatical, the seventh-day Sabbaths, which are annual, plus the every seventh year at the end, because the bottom one expands on the first one. So A, B, A plus. Isn't it interesting? And that's the way the, the language shows it to us. When we get to the Greek of Colossians 2.16, the Greek has the same structure, the same content. The word feast, heorte, in the entire New Testament, the word feast never means the Day of Atonement. The word feast in the New Testament never includes the Day of Trumpets. Interesting. The word feast, heorte, throughout the New Testament comes in about 20 to 30 times the word feast. It's always limited to, the, to Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost and Tabernacles. Heorte does not mean all the festivals. It means only the pilgrimage festivals. That's consistent in the New Testament. Fascinating. The Bible is very clear in its communication. It's we who have not done our work. We have not studied carefully enough. There is a new moon in the, in the um, New Testament mentioned only once. That's in Colossians 2, 16, the only time it appears. And the word there is neomania in some versions or numania. It's just a variation of the same word. New moons, in other words, monthly celebrations. And finally, we find the word Sabbath or Sabbata, Sabbaton. And this word Sabbata, I maintain, refers to trumpets, atonement, and sabbatical years, as we see from Greek manuscripts and from the Septuagint. We have again an ABA pattern. ABA. So this is an interesting structure. So if you, people say to you, it's annual, monthly, weekly, that's human logic. <laughs> okay. It's not from the text. 
The Hebrew from Hosea 2 verse 11 is annual, monthly, annual, and extended. And then the same here, annual, monthly, uh, monthly, annual. Very interesting. But it comes from deep digging into the Bible. Careful research will be richly repaid. I'm going to share with you a very complex structure here. I don't want you to try to write it down. This is a comparison of, stru a comparison of structural study of Colossians 2 verse 21. You can open your Bibles. Maybe we should go there. Colossians 2.21. Because people say, oh, you found something unique. Let's go to Colossians 2.21, and then I'll show it to you on the screen. Let's go to the Bible itself. Colossians 2, verse 21. Then we'll uh, give you the Colossians 2.16.1. We want to compare and ask the question, do we have another example in the same book how there is a, what we call a, a chiastic structure? Let's look at verse 21. It's a short verse, just nine or ten words. Do not touch. Question, how do you touch with what? Your hand. Keep it up, right? Do not touch. Next one. Do not what? Taste. How do you taste? Your mouth. Then what does it say? Do not handle. How do you handle? With what? Your hand. Watch A, B, A. You follow that? Here's a chiastic structure right here in this. It's an ABA pattern. Do not touch. Do not taste. Do not handle. There it is. Just five verses after Colossians 2.16. So it's not unique to expect uh, to see this here. So here it is, the Greek, may hapse, do not gently touch. It's the word for gently touch, using your hands. Okay, the Greek says, may de guse, do not taste. Okay, using your tongue. And then it says, may de thiges, do not roughly handle. So both are handling, but the one is gentle, taste, and then roughly handle. Also with your hands. Interesting. There's an ABC. And again, no, sorry, not ABC. ABA plus. Because the first one is gentle. The next one is rough. But it's still using your hands. Interesting. So we find these ABA patterns or ABCBA patterns all the way in Scripture. And it gives you the idea that this is not an ABC human logic that we have here. But an ABA pattern. Fascinating. Now we want to go to back to Colossians 2.16. Now that you've looked at Colossians 2.21, notice what it has here, Colossians 2.16. Intertextual, linguistic, semantic, structural, and contextual study of Colossians 2.16 shows the following. The Greek and the Hebrew. The Hebrew is chag, Greek is heorte, which is used for uh, the Passover, which includes unleavened bread, and first fruits, Pentecost, tabernacles. These are yearly pilgrim feasts. Next, we have the Hebrew word chodesh, the Greek word neomania. This is just repeating and summarizing what we've had before. These are the regular lunar celebrations of which there are 239 lunar months in 19 years. And it's a very complex me method I mentioned to you of the metonic scale to keep the lunar uh, um, years somewhat in sync with the solar years. So every 19 years, this, the, the, the sequence is back in sync. These are the monthly new moons. And then finally, A+, plus, the echo. The Hebrew is Shabbaton or Shabbat. The Greek is Sabaton or Sabata. And these are trumpets, atonement, and sabbatical years. These are yearly plus. These are the ceremonial Sabbaths. Again, an ABA pattern. Fascinating. Now, this is therefore how I have diagrammed Colossians 2.16. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival, A, that's the first part, a new moon, B, or a Sabbath, A. These are ceremonial Sabbaths, not Seventh-day Sabbath. I know this is complex material, but it's fascinating as you study. The structure and everything supports. It's not ABC, annual, monthly, weekly. It's ABA. Annual pilgrimage festivals, B, monthly uh, new moons. A, the special holy ceremonial Sabbaths. Okay, what does Ellen White uh, say? She says, the human faculties, when under the special direction of the grace of God, are capable of being used to the best purpose on earth. Ignorance does not increase the humility or spirituality of any professed follower of Christ. The truths of the divine word can be best appreciated by whom? An intellectual Christian. Now, I, I put that there intentionally because I knew that today is going to be a deep study. I want to challenge you to be intellectual Christians, to dig deeply. And, and, and the statement continues, be an intellectual Christian. It's not done yet. She continues next, next, and she says, Christ can be best glorified by those who serve him how? Intelligently. Okay. This is from Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 361, paragraph 1. The great 
object of education is to enable us to use the power which God has given us in such a manner as to represent the religion of the Bible and promote the glory of God. That's the point. And the reason I want you to be aware of it, please make sure that you in your own right become a careful student of Scripture. I mentioned John Gilmore, right? This lay person who discovered... I believe God blessed him to discover the, poet, the poetry of Ellen White. He is not a scholar, folks. He's not a, he never went to, as far as I went to, to go and study theology ever. And yet he discovered some of this beautiful structure. You can do it as a lay person. Don't ever become discouraged. I have another friend who's a dentist, never studied theology. He's a close friend of mine. I've spent a lot of time at his home. I actually celebrated my 60th birthday right there. I was with him. And he has done some incredible study as well. His name is Brent Shakespeare, clear, a good friend of mine. We stay in touch. We call each other. Find, especially men, find you guys, find another man who can walk with you in spiritual things. Are you listening? Okay, if you're married, obviously. <laughs> now, if you're, uh, you know, you're getting ready to get married, stay in touch with that young lady. And, and ladies, I encourage you to find another woman or two to walk with you and to help you on your journey. Dig deeply. Become an intellectual Christian, an intelligent person, because it's better understood. The reason I also want to emphasize this part, I tell you why. Unfortunately, my friends, the feast keepers, have, they generally are what I call the lay people in the church. And when they hear pastors and professors and Bible students, you know what they actually say? We don't need pastors. We don't need professors. We can st study the Bible on our own. In, in essence, they are rejecting the gifts of the Spirit. The Bible in Ephesians 4 says the Holy Spirit has given some to be pastors, some to be teachers, some to be evangelists, some to be apostles. But unfortunately, feast keepers and others who are going astray have rejected the gifts of the Spirit so that they continue on their own way. And so I want to urge us, let's use all the gifts that God has given us. Are you with me? And that's why I mentioned John Gilmore and Brent Shakespeare. They are careful students of the Bible. Even though they do other jobs, God is blessing all of us with appropriate spiritual gifts. And the church needs it to come to the maturity that God wants us to become to. Let's not reject gifts just because the gifts are showing us we're going the wrong way. Keep that in mind. Ellen White, what does she talk about? Again, I want to remind you, I've mentioned it before, but in this session again... There are a thousand temptations in disguise prepared for those who have the light of truth. For Adventists, she's talking about us. And the only safety for any of us is in receiving no new doctrine, no new interpretation of the Scriptures without first submitting it to brethren of experience. Lay it before them, okay, in a humble, teachable spirit, with earnest prayer. And if they see no light in it, Yield what? To their judgment. For in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Counsels to writers edit and editors. Uh, page 47.1. And so I urge you to be careful and be... And why do I say that? Let me illustrate that here for a moment. A few years ago, three years ago or so, four years ago, when I was writing this book called Feast Keeping in the Faithful, and yesterday was Sabbath, so I did not want to promote it. And I did mention that I have the book. The only reason I ended up doing this was because there were so many important questions raised by feast keepers. I, I didn't have the answers. And then I put the material together to provide a resource. And because I'm a pastor, I, I'm employed by the conference, and I keep saying, you don't have to pick up a copy. I'm already taken care of. God has blessed me. But people kept asking for questions, as answers for these questions. So I put it together. But when I was just about done, I sent material to certain people I trusted, and I asked for their input. I, I actually sent a copy of material to your president, Dr. David Spencer, and I sent it to conference presidents and to scholars, including to Dr. Richard Davidson. He read the material, he read, and he, and he wrote back. <laughs> I'm embarrassed, but I tell you it's true. He wrote back and he said, Ron, he was, he's a friend. Dear friends will do this to you. Ron, I will give you a lukewarm endorsement for this book. <laughs> this man had been an elder in my church. I was his pastor. And before that, I had studied my doctoral study. And he was my advisor when I was a doctoral student. And he writes back, I will give you a lukewarm endorsement. You don't want to have a lukewarm endorsement on the back of your book. He said, this book may help you a little bit in some places, you know. I thought, what, what is this? But he wrote and he said, I disagree with you because you in your 
he was, I'm paraphrasing, in your passion, you have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Basically, he said to me, you're an extremist. I'm in a nice way. And he told me where and why and how. And I read his letter. Fortunately, the Lord gave me a humble heart to accept that rebuke. And I was so thankful. I read it. I said, oh, he is right. I've, I've gone too far. And so I wrote back to him. I said, thank you, Dr. Davidson. Thank you, Dick. Can I use what you gave? I'm going to expand. I'm going to use it. I'm going to. And so in this book, probably six times you will see this concept expanded. And I changed what I did. I was thankful I had counselors. This counselor, this friend of mine stopped me from going astray, for being an extreme and throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And as a result, I'm thankful because now Dr. Rodriguez, the, the, he was director of biblical research, he has said, and he has endorsed this book. He's now retired. And he is, he is strongly supportive of this book only because I listened to my brothers. I listened. I took counsel. I'm urging you, please take the counsel of the brethren. Make sure you take your new ideas to them. And so this is what, what I, I needed to do. I'm thankful that I did that. By the way, the book, Judging the Sabbath, we have only one copy here as an illustration. It's a book that's used for the seminary in classes at Andrews University because this book deals with one text. Of course, Colossians 2.16, whereas this book here, Feastkeeping, and to, for South Africa, we've added 50 pages in uh, because of questions that have come up and new material that I was not aware of. So keep that in mind. And as a result of doing the work of this book, go back to that one, Judging the Sabbath, okay, this previous book that Andrews University Press published, Dr. Rodriguez wrote a book review, and this is what he says, this document, Judging the Sabbath, on Colossians 2.16, contains the most complete and detailed scholarly study of the biblical phrase feast, new moons, or Sabbath in Colossians 2.16. Dupre has demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the language they use at the law court, you know what I mean? Before they sentence somebody, beyond a reasonable doubt that in Colossians 2.16, Paul was not dealing with the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, again, this is my own personal study. I'm convicted about it. It is so clear as you study everything. They then asked, and they've actually published now a chapter in this book, the book called Interpreting Scripture. We've summarized the 220 pages into about six pages. Do you know how hard it was to do that? Oh, it was so hard to summarize, squeeze it in. I'm suggesting that there is light. This, I believe, appears to be genuine new light from the Bible. We used to simply say the context shows that Colossians 2.16 is ceremonial Sabbath. We said the context. Now there's enough additional intertextual, contextual, structural, linguistic, semantic, grammatical evidence that it is ceremonial Sabbath. New light, by the way, expands on old light. Ellen White puts it this way. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. Important point now, new truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. Christ Object Lessons, page 127. Why I'm concerned about the feast-keeping movement is because the feast-keeping movement, the new light, contradicts old lights. And when it contradicts, then we know it's not new light, but it is old darkness. Keep that in mind. New light never contradicts old light. Be very careful, very, very cautious. Keep that in mind. And by the way, I know I've not answered all the questions. It was, it's hard to get into six presentations, 340 pages or so, okay? That's the approximate amount of the, that. So a, a pastor at the seminary one day, when he saw the material I'd done, he wrote a letter to me. He said this, for a long time I have prayed that God may bless someone with wisdom and his spirit to write a good paper of Colossians 2.16. Joy and relief are the words that most closely represent my experience by re of reading your paper. He was from, from Eastern Europe, so his English wasn't exactly normal. Every page I had to praise God and to jump around like a small kid for jo from joy with a thankful heart for allowing God to use you. It's exciting when you get a letter like that, somebody who says, praise God, and we all want to be used by God. Isn't that so? That's our desire. And I'm thankful that God was willing to use me uh, uh, just as his instrument. So when I went to Seventh Heavens Believe, the book, I found out that my study actually from Scripture is corroborated there, and this is how we put it in our book. I keep going back there, and the reason I go back to Seventh Heavens Believe is not simply to parrot what the church says, but to let you know that I am part of a global movement, and the Adventist church's view is even more thoroughly biblical than we even realized it. <laughs>
there's additional evidence, extremely more evidence that our view is ab absolutely, absolutely accurate. I'm glad we did put it in our book. It was in our book before I even did my study. When Christ died, he fulfilled the prophetic symbolism of the sacrificial system, type met antitype, and the ceremonial law came to an end. No more worries about the ceremonial laws with their complex requirements regarding food <coughs> and drink offerings, celebrations of various festivals, Passover, Pentecost, etc., new moons, or ceremonial Sabbaths, Colossians 2.16, Hebrews 9.10, which were only a shadow of things to come, Colossians 2.17. That's in the book, page 274. I have to make a few comments on Colossians 2.14 because that's gotten, that's gotten so many people confused. I hope and I think most lay people are not confused, but on certain places, such on certain television stations that are not thoroughly Adventist, people claim to be Adventists, they are confusing this text. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, King James Version, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. I know there's a new interpretation that is coming along, but it is not biblical. If you look at the actual words, the word exalapsus, wipe out, is used in Revelation 3 verse 5, chapter 7 verse 17, and 21 verse 4, to wipe out. And historically, we have evidence that it was used for the wiping out of a law. That's the way it was used at that time, as a, a scholar has now shown. So both in the text and from outside, there's corroboration. So it's wiped out. This is the word that has caused most confusion, the hierographon. Okay? And people have said, oh, when we look outside of the Bible, it is used as a certificate of death, etc. Well, sometimes, yes. But the question is, what does the internal evidence show? And the internal evidence shows that it is a handwriting. That's what the word means. Chayr is hand. Grapho, as graphics, is writing. It's the word handwriting. Historically and biblically, that's what it is. And then the word tois dogmason. I'm giving this for those who've heard some of these arguments, and they are being made right now in different places. Means with its decrees. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 corroborates that. Ellen White herself supports that interpretation. This is the handwriting with its decrees, or handwriting of ordinances. And then one more word is hupe nantios. It is contrary to us. And you see that concept in Deuteronomy 31 verse 26. So those are the issues that are being raised, the questions, and yet the answers are there. I want to summarize it this way. Colossians 2, 14, the answers. And what's interesting, you have another chiastic structure, okay? A, B, C, and C, B, A. Very interesting. All in that passage. You'll see it starts at the top. There you have principality and power, and down here you have principalities and power. Here you have circumcision without hands, and here you have handwriting. And here buried, you were raised, dead. Notice the dead and buried, alive. It's interesting. When they wrote back then, they wrote in a beautiful poetic manner. Because the writers of the New Testament, even though they wrote in Greek, they were Jews, they were Hebrews. So they used the same style. So we know that even from the manner in which this whole passage was written, this was hand, that was hand. It's handwriting. It's not one of the other things that some have begun to suggest they are. And I'm thankful that this is still our standard biblical interpretation. And just <coughs> not too long ago, Dr. Derek Morris. How many of you remember Dr. Morris? He was here about two years ago. Dr. Derek Morris, he is the editor of Ministry Magazine. A few months ago, he contacted me. He said, Ron, would you please do us a favor? Would you write an article for Ministry Magazine? It goes to all the pastors <coughs> and write an article on Colossians 2, verses 14 through 17. It's due July 1. So guess what I'm going to be doing in a few days when I'm done? I brought all the material with me, and I have to get that article done. It's going to be published in Ministry Magazine, so all the pastors will know the best of biblical scholarship over centuries that we have, and unfortunately, people are getting confused. So I want to go to this text as it's in the New International Version, which is also quite accurate. He blotted out the written code with its decrees, or the handwriting of ordinances, King James, New King James, which stood against us, taking it out of the way by nailing it to his cross. Now, I know there are more questions that people will ask about this, but for right now, and I'm happy to chat with you afterwards, linguistically, grammatically, structurally, contextually, intertextually, and historically, what is it? It's the requirements of the ceremonial system. The, inf the evidence is growing larger and larger and larger that our traditional historic position is solidly scriptural. I'm so thankful God raised up this movement. I'm so thankful God is still leading us. Don't just listen to various voices that are claiming things. Let's try to remain united. Ellen White, her divinely inspired comments, talking about Colossians 2 verse 14 says, the ceremonial system was made up of symbols, 
pointing to Christ, to his sacrifice and his priesthood. This ritual law with its sacrifices and ordinances, not just sacrifices, sacrifices and ordinances was to be performed by the Hebrews until type met antitype in the death of Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Then all the sacrificial offerings were to cease. It is this law that Christ took out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2.14. So in a nutshell, structurally, Simplified, we have this concept. Pilgrim feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, tabernacles, yearly, monthly, new moons, yes. And then we have again a ceremonial Sabbath of trumpets, atonement, sabbatical years. They were yearly. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So these things all were pointing to Jesus, verse 17 tells us. And of course, verse 17 has been debated as well. So give me five minutes, then we'll sing a hymn and we'll take a break. Okay, here it is, in English, transliterated rather, Hi Eston Skiaton Melaton Todesoma Christu. And it says in the New King James, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance body is of Christ. And this has confused people. They said that the word is was added by the translators. It is true. But the translators have to do that, and they do it multiple times, since in the Greek, the, the Greek often leaves the verb is out. It's understood. And in the books of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, you will find that. And throughout the New Testament, the translator has to add the word is to make it clear. But then the big question has come. It says that it's a shadow of things to come. Hmm. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. This is where we have to go. In fact, right here at this conference this weekend, uh, this concept has been mentioned. I've been here since Wednesday traveling and I, somebody raised this but it says these are things to come so look at your Bibles let's turn up the screen Matthew chapter 11 and I want you to notice the language things to come the context of Matthew 11 is John the Baptist if you look at it carefully verse 9 what did you go out to see a prophet yet yes I say and more than a prophet obviously Jesus is talking about John verse 11 surely I say to you those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. There it is. Now go to verse 13, uh, 14. And if you are willing to receive it, verse 14. He, John the Baptist, listen to the language. He is Elijah who what? Is to come. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What did Jesus just say? John already came, right? In fact, at this point, John who's finished his ministry, he was in prison. And yet Jesus says, John is the Elijah who is to come. Was Jesus confused? Was Jesus telling a lie? What, what was it? Think about this carefully. Back then, they didn't have what we call inverted commas. Jesus is quoting from which book of the Bible? Anybody know? Old Testament talked about an Elijah who is to come. Malachi, you're right. Jesus is quoting Malachi. So Jesus is going backwards in time, and he's saying, by the way, did you remember Malachi? Malachi talked about an Elijah who is to come. John the Baptist is that Elijah who is to come. Jesus is not saying, from this point of, in time in which I'm talking, I'm talking about the future from where I'm talking. There is an Elijah who is to come in the future. No, no, no. I'm quoting from back there. Interesting. That's the terminology used. To come. And so when we go to, back to the text, back to Colossians, it's the same concept that we find there. The phrase, back to the screen, the phrase to come is used for what was future from the perspective of when it was predicted. Are you with me? These are shadows of things to come, meaning from the time when it was predicted. When was it predicted? During the time of Moses. And so they're quoting from back then. I'm thankful that there are some Bibles out there called the International Children's Bible. They realize that we are, um, that the, the kids don't understand the language, so they've made this clear for the children. And sometimes we are spiritually children. So they wrote this. In the past, in the past, these things were like a shadow of what was to come. You follow? <laughs> there it is. It's not saying from this point in time, Paul's not saying from now, AD 60, when I'm writing the letter to the Colossians, from now it's a shadow of things to come. And unfortunately, some folk right here in this conference have gotten confused because they read it as though Paul is writing from now to the future. Paul is talking about from when it was written. Let's not get confused. You can find a very similar concept in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. The law has only a shadow of the good things to come, not the true form of these realities. So keep that in mind. While the weekly Sabbath was ordained at the cross of creation week for all mankind, the annual Sabbaths were an integral part of the Jewish system of rites and ceremonies instituted at Mount Sinai. Going back to that time pointing forward, right, which pointed to the coming of the Messiah and the observance of which terminated with his death on the cross. Things to come in the future 
looking at from the past, hundreds of years ago. And of course, the statement we had before, that one was from our book, Seven Heavens Believe. And again, same thing here, they're reminding us, the apostle was talking about this, and notice, quoting Colossians 2.16 in our book, Seven Heavens Believe, and then they say, since the context of this passage deals with ritual matters, the Sabbaths here referred to are the ceremonial Sabbaths of the Jewish annual festivals, which are a shadow or type of which the fulfillments were to come, correct, were to come in Christ. They've corrected that. A brief summary now, Colossians 2, 14 to 17. The linguistic links prove which is a Sabbath day. When you look at that, if the word the is there, etc. Hosea 2, 11 seems to be echoed in Colossians 2, 16. The chiasm shows verse 16 is yearly, monthly, yearly. Colossians 2, 16, ceremonial Sabbath, not the weekly Sabbath. Colossians 2, 14, these are the ceremonial law that was nailed to the cross. Colossians 2, 17 reveals that feasts point to Christ including this ceremonial Sabbath. In a nutshell, Adventism concludes that Colossians 2 shows feast days have ended, including the ceremonial Sabbath. So when we go from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, I suggest the inspired counsel we need to look at as we end this session. The Sabbath, seventh-day Sabbath, is a test that will come to the whole world. We need nothing to come in now to make a test before for God's people that shall make more severe for them the test they already have. The reason I say that is because the feast Sabbaths are becoming an additional test to make it harder for us. The way to dispel darkness is to admit light. The best way to deal with error is to present truth. And I hope by God's grace I have presented truth to you today. Desire of Ages, page 195. Finally, the Sabbath is God's love gift to the entire human race. I want to ask you to stand and sing with me one stanza of that beautiful hymn. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. And then we'll take a 10-minute break. Singing joyfully. Worthy, worthy. to always keep our eyes fixed upon the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this deep study of Colossians 2.16, corroborating, affirming, confirming how you have led our church through decades to understanding that this text deals with ceremonial Sabbaths, which we do, do not need to keep anymore. Thank you that we can continue to keep holy your seventh-day Sabbath. Bless us now in Jesus' name. 